Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm pleased to be here to provide an update on the safe return to school for Alberta's students. Last week, we extended the winter break by one week to allow school authorities time to plan in the face of the rapid surge of the Omicron variant. Understandably, school authorities were concerned about issues such as staff absences, not only for teachers, but also for the many other Albertans who support our students, such as bus drivers, teaching assistants, support staff, and administration. Over the past several days, my team and I have continued to work closely with school authorities. I'm extremely grateful for their input, and I'm so pleased to confirm that ECS and kindergarten to grade 12 students will return to classrooms on January 10th. Children who learn in person belong in the classroom, and they will be there with the added safety of rapid tests and medical grade masks. These will be distributed to schools as an added layer of protection to lower the risk of transmission of the Omicron variant. The government will begin distributing shipments of rapid tests and masks later this week, and all schools will have their initial shipments by the end of next week. Distribution to students and staff will occur as individual schools receive their supplies, and both rapid tests and masks will be shipped in phases. This is on top of the many significant health measures schools already have in place, such as vaccine, vaccine policies for staff, masking, distancing, and enhanced cleaning measures. In making this decision, we looked very carefully at information from school authorities, as well as health data. We also considered other jurisdictions in Canada who are doing similar things, such as BC and Manitoba. I also want to point out that many other places around the world have been committed to keeping schools open for in-class instruction, with additional measures in place. Take New York City, for example, where students spent last year learning online instead of in person. This year, they are very determined to remain in the classroom, despite the Omicron variant surge. Experts across Canada and around the world continue to stress the importance of in-person learning to the overall health of our children and our youth. And I myself have, had, have heard overwhelmingly from families that learning in person is best for children. Most children feel more connected, they learn better, and generally thrive when they are at school in person. This is why Alberta's government has placed such a high priority on safe in-classroom instruction and on making sure that our schools have the tools that they need. It's why we've invested more than $1 billion in taxpayer funding to help schools deal with COVID-19, uh, which includes $130 million in COVID mitigation funding for the 21-22 school year. We've also allowed school authorities to access taxpayer-funded reserves including operating reserves, which have grown to $464 million, an increase of more than $80 million since the, since, pardon me, the pandemic began. This is overall uh, school board operating and capital reserves currently sitting at over $700 million. Again, school board operating and capital reserves sitting at over $700 million. Additionally, as students return to the class, we're helping them get back on track. <clears throat> Students in grades four to nine and their parents will now be able to access free online tutoring resources starting next week. This will help them catch up on important skills and learn uh, and learning that they may have fallen behind on during the pandemic. The e-tutoring hub will be launched with pre-recorded video tutoring sessions on literacy and numeracy that students and their parents can access any time. And later this year, online tutoring will be expanded to include more subjects and grades, and live tutoring will be offered. Parents, students, and educators are encouraged to try the tool and give us feedback to inform future sessions. It's another crucial step to help students close the gap on pandemic learning, and it builds on our investment of up to $45 million to address COVID-related learning disruptions for students in grades one to three. 
Finally, Alberta Education is continuing to work closely with school authorities to support shifts that may be required for operational reasons, such as student or staff absences. School authorities will continue to have the flexibility to shift an individual class or grade to short-term at-home learning if needed. While decisions on shifting an entire school or school authority to at-home learning will continue to be approved by the government. Decisions will be made quickly and consideration will always be given to absenteeism rates and other relevant data, including local health data, if it is available. Again, I'd like to thank everyone in Alberta's education system who is continuing to prepare for the safe return of our students to the classroom next Monday, January 10th. And as I've said before, I'm always so impressed by the resilience shown by our students, our staff, our school boards, and our families in the whole education system. Kudos to all of them. And to the students and everyone who cares for them, thank you for your hard work and perseverance during two very tough years. And to the teachers and school staff, thank you for continuing to deliver the world-class education Alberta is known for. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Hinshaw for her update. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. Over the last 24 hours, we have identified about 4,752 new cases of COVID-19 and completed about 12,000 tests. Our positivity rate for lab-confirmed cases is 36.9%. Both of these numbers bring us to new record daily highs, underlining the impact of this wave. There are currently 470 people with COVID-19 in hospital, including 72 in the ICU. Sadly, I must announce that 11 new deaths have been reported to Alberta Health over the last 24 hours. My thoughts and sympathies are with the family and friends left behind to mourn these people and anyone who has recently lost a loved one from any cause. I know the rampant spread of Omicron has made this a challenging start to 2022 for many Albertans, including parents, children, teachers, school staff, and administrators, who are all working to do what's best for children in Alberta. Once again, the shifting nature of the virus required us all to pause and reevaluate the best path forward for the second half of the school year. We all know the impacts that being away from the classroom can have on our children's mental health, learning, and social interaction. We know that COVID infection has a low, but not zero, risk for children. We also know that in-person learning is critically important for many kids' educational and social development and can provide a sense of stability and normalcy in these challenging times. There are no perfect, completely risk-free solutions available to us or any jurisdiction around the world. And I believe the provincial approach balances the many competing risks that our children face. The use of rapid testing and medical masks, in addition to the measures already in place, will help to protect students and staff as they return to the classroom. Given the current situation, I also want to note that I strongly recommend that students in all grades wear masks, including kindergarten to grade three. To keep the risk in schools low, it will be critical for all of us to stay home and keep our children home if any of us have symptoms. I want to remind Albertans that we're in a very different situation today than we were when school started the past fall, this past fall, or the year before. That's thanks to widely available, safe, effective vaccines and the thousands of staff and students who've been immunized for COVID-19. Now, all children five years and older are eligible to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Approximately 85% of youth between the ages of 12 and 17 have received at least one vaccine dose and around 80% have received two. While children between five and 11 have only been eligible for vaccines since late November, 37% have already received at least one dose of vaccine. If your child hasn't been vaccinated against COVID-19 yet, 
I strongly recommend doing so as soon as possible. It is the single most effective tool we have to reduce the risk of infection and severe illness from the virus. A recent publication from the US CDC affirmed the safety of vaccine in five to 11 year olds, looking at 8.7 million doses of vaccine and identifying any significant adverse events such as fever and severe vomiting happening after only 0.001% of all doses. As parents, our first priority is always the safety and well-being of our children, and I understand the need to make the best data-informed decision for them. If you have questions about the vaccine or would like more information, please reach out to a medical professional to get answers. You can talk to your family doctor or pediatrician, call 811 or listen to the Pediatric Vaccine Town Hall recording that's posted on alberta.ca. Since March of 2020, children of all ages have sacrificed a lot to keep others safe. This was especially true in the early months of the pandemic when they missed out on in-person learning, extracurricular activities and time spent simply being kids. Now that we know more about preventing transmission and we have safe, effective vaccines available to everyone age five and older, I believe it is prudent to keep schools open for in-person instruction. However, we all have a role to play in helping to keep schools open and children safe by limiting community transmission. Next to getting vaccinated, the most critical thing we can do is stay home if we're sick, especially even with the mildest of symptoms. Wearing masks and keeping our distance at all times also reduces our risks of spreading the virus, but they cannot eliminate all risks of exposure. This is especially true with the highly transmissible Omicron variant. Each day, parents must complete a health assessment of their children to see if there are any signs of illness and should do a rapid test a couple of times a week to screen for asymptomatic infection and limit the risk of introducing infection into schools. These steps are critical to limiting exposure in schools and keeping them open. As a parent, I want to say that I understand the mixed emotions that many families may be feeling with today's announcement. As students return to the classroom next week, including my own, I know some parents will be relieved that their kids will get to see their friends and teachers in person again. At the same time, they may be worried about their children's health and well-being or have anxiety over the uncertainties of the new variant. Every family needs to make the right decision for their own situations, knowing that community transmission will continue to be high over at least the next month. The current approach balances the risks all our children face, and each family will need to weigh the impacts of those risks for them. Finally, given the changes we've made to our testing protocols and contact notification process in light of the Omicron variant, I also want to advise Albertans that we will be moving to a different approach for school reporting that reflects the current situation. Similar to other provinces with the growth of COVID-19 cases, Alberta is now focused on investigating cases in high risk settings, such as continuing care and those who work in health care. Other cases, including in students and school staff, will still be notified of their own test result and they will receive a call to ensure they're aware of their isolation requirements. But AHS will no longer have the capacity to do full case investigations for those non high risk cases. As a result of this change and similar to other provinces, Alberta is assessing different options for an approach to school reporting that reflects the current situation. Details on this will be shared as soon as they are available. There are no easy paths to take in a pandemic, but as has always been critical, we must do our best to look at the whole health of our communities, our families and our children. Thank you and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw and Minister LaGrange. We are now going to the phone lines to answer a few questions from media. Everyone in the queue will get an opportunity to ask a question and have a follow-up question. I ask that you please identify yourself and what media outlet you represent and who your question is for. Operator, please put through the first caller. Thank you. The first question is from Jeremy Thompson, CTV. Hi there. A question for, uh, I believe, the Education Minister. Um, Lots of questions from uh, some parents and, and teachers still about, uh, you know, air quality in, in schools. Um, 
some folks running into issues, you know, have fun, they fundraise to, to buy their own HEPA filter, and then bureaucracy gets in the way from them actually getting it into the classroom. So wondering what, uh, what's being done to ensure air quality can be monitored and maybe improved and uh, any associated funding with that. Uh, well, thank you for the question. And uh, air quality has always been a concern from the start of the pandemic. Uh, that's why we allocated as a province $250 million towards capital maintenance and renewal funding, accelerated capital maintenance and renewal funding for school boards to access. Many of the, that funding was used uh, by school boards to upgrade HVAC and improve their systems. Um, I know that uh, the CMOH uh, and Dr. Hinshaw may want to add um, once I'm finished speaking here to my my comments uh, that their recommendation is to make sure that the ventilation systems that are in place are in good working order. Um, all our school authorities have made that their highest priority and I know they are continuing to look at what improvements can be made should there be any required. Now additionally I know that uh, standalone uh, help a filter um, uh, you know systems that can be placed into a classroom unless their um, the overall system is looked at by experts sometimes that actually can be more of a hindrance than um, than an improvement to the system. So again, uh, looking to see what can be done, but school authorities have, have made this their top priority and they continue to work on uh, further refinements if necessary. Dr. Hinshaw, would you like to add anything? No, she's saying that um, my answer was sufficient. Thank you for that. And Jeremy, do you have a follow-up question? I, I do, and uh, I, you know, either the minister or Dr. Hinshaw could answer this one. And basically, wondering, you know, with with the change to um, reporting and, and tracking cases in schools, you know, can you just kind of walk me through what will happen now once, you know, if someone tests positive, or you know, I guess it, is it different for a student and a teacher? Uh, well. It Obviously, uh, we will continue to, um, as Dr. Hinshaw said, that if there, um, there are people with symptoms, whether it's a student or a, a teacher or a staff member, they should stay home uh, and take a rapid test. Um, and if that turns out to be positive, uh, they should report it to the school. Uh, we will then um, look at the school authorities themselves will track absenteeism. Uh, from a general perspective, we are looking to refine the actual numbers that school authorities would uh, be looking at. Um, if there's high absenteeism, whether it's students or staff, um, as well as um, spread within the community, et cetera. All of those factors would be taken into account. From a school authority perspective, they would look at do we need to shift or do they need to shift a classroom or a grade to online learning if it's required because of high absenteeism and other health uh, indicators within their schools. If not, um, they would continue on, provide the subs, et cetera. If, in fact, there are larger numbers, then we would look to uh, to, to them to approve those shifts. And if there are even larger numbers affecting a school or a whole school authority, then they would approach my department and we would have the conversations on if there's a shift required for a larger group of individuals. Thank you, Minister. Operator, can you put through the next caller? Audrey Nouveau, Radio Canada. Hi there, my question is Hi. for Dr. Henshaw. Um, you said yourself that the positive Positivity rate is much higher, and the transmissibility is also. So how can you be so sure that children still are at low risk of infection and transmission? The uh, community transmission risk right now is the highest it's ever been. So I want to be clear that out in the general community, no matter what the setting, there is a very high transmission risk right now. And I continue to advise that people do everything they can to minimize the number of close contacts they have. However, I also believe that if we were to uh, shut schools across the entire province, uh, we would be imposing much greater harm on all of those students by um, not allowing them the opportunity for in-school learning at this time. We have additional measures that are in place with respect to the regular rapid testing that's available, medical mask use, uh, and so I believe that the, the ability to then uh, monitor and intervene if there are significant local risks in some of the ways that Minister LaGrange has just mentioned would be the best balance because we know that, again, there is a significant risk of harm to kids 
uh, by keeping them home for long periods of time. And so returning to school in person gives the opportunity to adjust and uh, focus on where there are specific local issues rather than making that decision preemptively for the entire province. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. And for your follow-up question? Uh, yes, um, I'm not entirely sure I understood what you said about the online learning portion, so I, my apologies, but um, isn't there a way to put maybe one or two weeks of online learning to kind of act as a buffer before going back in person for those children? Uh, there's always options uh, of looking at, again, universal online learning versus universal in-person learning. We know that uh, kids have had uh, different experiences over the past couple of years. We've tried to keep schools open. Um, however, there have been times when they've had to shift. The challenge that we're facing right now uh, as we look ahead is that we wouldn't know um, necessarily what length of time would that be. And again, to just close schools across the entire province as opposed to uh, allowing opportunities to return and then using interventions where they're appropriate in terms of targeted areas is the, in my opinion, best balance of the benefits to kids of being able to be present in school and where there is significant transmission in a local area, then there can be movement online in that particular local area where it's needed. Uh, we know that kids have had a significant toll on their mental health, uh, on their development over the past two years. And so every uh, incremental loss of in-person school time uh, adds up and so this is uh, this has a different consequence than spending a few weeks online early in the pandemic this is coming at a time where there is again that heavy heavy burden of the mental health and the challenges that kids have faced throughout the pandemic and we need to look at that whole health of our kids thank you dr hinshaw operator can you put through the next caller wyatt sharp the wyatt sharp show uh Hi there. I'm just going to ask um, for the Education Minister. You mentioned other jurisdictions are, are keeping their schools open. I believe you mentioned New York City as an example. However, a lot of provinces in Canada have um, decided to delay it longer than Alberta. Nova Scotia just recently announced that they're delaying it until January the 17th. Um, the case positivity rate uh, in Alberta is actually higher than it was in Ontario today. Ontario's was 28.1% and Ontario has decided to delay it by two weeks. So I'm just wondering how Alberta will look at other jurisdictions in the future when making decisions as to whether or not to keep schools open. Great question, Wyatt, and thank you for that. Um, so we look at it in, in of course, looking to balance uh, the best interest of Alberta students, um, but also looking to see what other provinces are doing. Uh, we know that Ontario has taken a different course, but they're at a different stage in the uh, Omicron variant um, uh, transmissibility uh, across the province. Uh, we look at the fact that our hospitalization numbers and our um, and our uh, ICU numbers continue to to stay, um, you know, relatively low at this point in time. Uh, we feel that at this point in time, we are ready to go back. We've had the additional one week, spoken to school divisions. I spoke, had a meeting with all the school boards and superintendents this morning, uh, school board chairs, and uh, feeling very strongly that they're ready, uh, given the extra time that they've had to make sure that they're prepared. As Dr. Hinshaw indicated, uh, there is higher transmissibility that will come into our, our schools and into our classrooms, but we need to mitigate that with the, the overall health of our children, uh, which is ultimately important. And I just wanna highlight um, that our schools were safe before the pandemic. They were safe the last two years during the pandemic with all of the measures that we put in place. And with these additional measures, they will continue to be safe. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And Wyatt, do you have a follow-up question? I do, yeah. Um, so just on the hospitalizations part, so. Um, as you did point out, Ontario does have a significantly higher number of hospitalizations. Um, their hospitalizations today was 2,081, uh, and I believe you meant, uh, Dr. Hinshaw mentioned that Alberta's was only 470. But when you look at the population of Ontario and the population of Alberta, obviously Ontario's population is over three times the population of Alberta. So would you not expect Ontario's? Hospitalization rate to be that much higher than it is in Alberta? 
On a per capita basis, um, but when we look at uh, the fact that uh, Alberta continues, uh, you know, not to have the um, spike that Ontario has, um, Ontario is in a different situation than we are. They've made different decisions all along. Uh, last year, they had their students out right till the end of the school year. They only returned to in-person learning in September. So, I, you know, as much as we look to them, they have different circumstances. If Dr. Hinch, I would like to speak to this. Uh, she certainly is welcome to on um, the hospitalization and rates and numbers, um, but I will. I'll turn it over to Dr. Hinshaw. We know that hospitalizations are a lagging indicator, so uh, we will be watching that closely as Ontario is slightly ahead of us in the Omicron curve. Uh, again, we know that there are no zero risk options. There never have been. And we need to consider that whole health of our students as we consider that province-wide option, knowing that we still have that ability to uh, use local mitigation measures where we're seeing a particular surge and knowing that kids have had the burden of being online learning uh, significant numbers of times over the last year, even though we've tried to keep it minimal. Uh, so again, this is giving us that ability to uh, use local and targeted measures where they're most appropriate, rather than depriving all students across the province of the opportunity to return to in-class learning. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. Operator, can you put through the next caller? David Staples, Edmonton Journal. Hi, uh, this is for uh, Dr. Hinshaw and I guess the minister. Um, uh, the minister just said that schools have been safe throughout, and I'm just wondering if, if we can look at, um, there's been various states of uh, uh, COVID, you know, where, where people were unvaccinated before. Um, it's been, uh, it seems like a more deadly disease under the Delta as it compared to the Omicron. So how safe now, in terms of ranking the safety, how safe in the next, month will schools be in Alberta as compared to at the start of the pandemic or when when uh, we had uh, uh, Delta last spring and this and this fall um, how safe relatively are the schools compared to before uh, we know with our approach previously in school we uh, typically if we did see in school transmission it was to a small number of people there were rare instances where um, there were larger outbreaks, but for the most part, transmission was maintained to a very small number of people. Uh, BC has done a very robust evaluation that uh, has been um, put out publicly that indicates that the average number of people who acquired um, infection, if there, were, if there was an in-school transmission, was about two, uh, which included that, that delta. And again, we used very similar mitigation measures in our classrooms to British Columbia. So we've seen throughout the pandemic that uh, while the risk of introduction into a school is higher when there's high community risk, the actual school environment continues to be one where there is uh, limited risk of onward spread. Again, not zero, uh, but we've kept it minimal. With Omicron, the risk of transmission in the community uh, is definitely higher, which is why there's additional uh, mitigating measures that have been put in place into schools. Uh, however, the individual risk of Omicron in terms of severity does seem to be lower. So with respect to the school environment, uh, my assessment would be that it's relatively similar to what we saw previously, where um, even though Omicron is a more transmissible virus, we have additional mitigation measures in place at this point in time, and that uh, individual risk of severity is lower. And given the very significant benefit that schools provide both at an individual and a population level, again, uh, it is my belief that we should do everything we can to keep schools open, uh, even as we strive to keep community spread lower by use of other tools. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. David, do you have a follow-up question? Yes. Um, I, I believe that last um, May, when schools went online for a time, I believe it was then, that the driver of that was teachers um, getting sick with COVID and not having enough teachers and substitute teachers to keeping, keep things running. And I'm wondering with the high transmissibility of the Omicron, um, is there any consideration to having teachers, I, I mean, they might be declared essential workers already, and you've talked about that already, 
could teachers be seen as essential workers who can go to work if they have a positive test but are asymptomatic and not showing any, any signs? Is that under consideration to keep the schools open? Well, certainly at this point in time, we're looking to um, access all of the sub substitute teachers that we have available when they're when they're needed. Um, we would look to other mitigating factors first. Um, should that be required, we can look at it at a later point. But at this point in time, that's not being considered. Thank you, Minister. Operator, can you put through the next caller? Lauren Pullen, Global Calgary. Hi there, thanks for taking my question this afternoon. Uh, the first one is for the minister and actually a follow up on that staffing question. We have heard from a local school division that the number of teachers with COVID-19 has increased dramatically over the winter break. Of course, we've seen Omicron transmission uh, increase dramatically and short staffing uh, has previously, of course, been one of the reasons for schools needing to shift online. Can you quantify what the ministry has heard from school divisions about staffing levels for the January 10th reopening? And maybe take us through what the staffing plan is so that we don't wind up in a yo-yo type effect here in two or three weeks, possibly having to shift online. So every school authority um, is responsible for their own staffing. So each one will look different. Um, you know, different jurisdictions have access to different numbers of um, substitute teachers, educational supports, et cetera. Uh, so it will look different across the province. What I'm hearing, what I heard from school divisions this morning was that they have been making plans. They've been utilizing this week to, uh, to enhance their cleaning protocols, to make sure that they are are able to to look at what might be coming in next week um, in terms of staff shortages, um, if there are any. Um, right now, there, I've heard as you know that there were um, some school divisions that um, had early absences of around five percent. I also want to remind everyone that now with Omicron, that the isolation period after testing positive with Omicron is five days. So that will affect also how quickly uh, students and uh, staff members can get back into the classroom. So there's many factors to look at. We are continuing to monitor it very closely and we'll work with school divisions uh, to help them uh, navigate through this very, and it'll be tricky. I'm, I'm not saying it'll be easy, but it, uh, we certainly will help them navigate through these uh, interesting times. Thank you, Minister. Caller, do you have a follow-up question? I do, thank you. And this one is uh, for both the Minister and Dr. Hinshaw. Uh, Minister, you said that you looked at health data in making this decision. Can you specifically point to and explain what that data was, what it showed, and uh, will it be publicly released so that everyone can uh, take a look at it? Well, we looked at uh, health data from across the province as well as what the health data is telling us in terms of the effects of uh, prolonged online learning um, or out of the classroom learning for students and the detrimental effects. Um, there's uh, numerous data across um, not only Canada but across the world that is highlighting that and uh, we will certainly uh, share that data as you know as we are able to. Um, Dr. Hinch, I'm not sure if there's anything you would like to further add to this? Um, she's not indicating that there's anything further she'd like to add. Thank you, Minister. We have time for one more round of questions. Operator, can you put through the last caller? Sarah Comedina, Global News. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, when it comes to the supplies that are going to be sent uh, with rapid test kits and other PPE that are being sent to the schools, uh, do you expect them it all to be delivered on January 10th. I know you mentioned the phases, but will schools have enough supplies on January 10th? So we had uh, school authorities uh, get back to us uh, by late day Monday with specific numbers on sizes of masks because of course we will need pediatric masks for our younger students um, as well as adult size masks and um, they have returned that information to us. We're working very closely with AHS and uh, Municipal Affairs to stage that um, that delivery um, to schools. Uh, some school authorities have preferred that the deliveries go directly to the schools. Others have preferred that it goes to a central location and they will take care of dispersing it. So we are certainly respecting school authorities' wishes in that regard. We anticipate that masks and rapid tests will be going out the door and to school authorities by the end of this week with all deliveries uh, to school authorities, the initial deliveries by next week and then further phasing after that. So of course, we are going to supply um, them uh, over the course of January and into 
to February. So we're going to continue those supplies uh, to ensure that they have the proper amounts that they require. Thank you, Minister. And do you have a follow-up question? Yes. Um, a big part of today's announcement was the online tutoring that's going to be offered. I mean, with that, what, what have we seen with students when it comes to um, their grades and their reading levels and math skills and all of that uh, because of online learning? How, like, did, did many students suffer or fall behind? Uh, what we're hearing um, is that we are hearing from school authorities that uh, there has been some um, some learning loss during the periods of disruption that have occurred over the last uh, year and a half, two years. Um, certainly, uh, school authorities are, are mitigating that as best they can, but this is an additional support for our students and for their families, uh, something that they can access during their home times uh, for additional help, something that uh, teachers can tap into, again, as an additional tool to help them through that, um, that process. Um, teachers have been doing an amazing job under very difficult circumstances. So I want to, again, thank our teachers and our teaching community for all of the great work that they've been doing under some really stressful times. And so uh, I thank them for the great work that they're doing. This is just an additional support for that, um, the possible learning loss that has occurred. Thank you, Minister. And with that, that is all the time that we have today. So we're going to wrap this up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.